Hello. <laughs> so hang on a second while I mirror us to Facebook and then we can get rolling. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Chris. I really, it's really been a pleasure. Happy, happy win Thursday. What? Happy Thursday, everybody. Thursday. Cheers. Congratulations. Congratulations to you too. Well, we get to hang out and just like chill this time. We don't have to like, you know, get prepped or, you know, have something to say or a speech ready or anything like that. <laughs> I know we were sweating bullets, Chris, shooting that video. Oh. You guys did so good though on that video. You really did. Hard winging it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you wouldn't stick to a script, so. No, then I would just look weirder trying to do it with a script. <laughs> uh, All right, we're live on Facebook, so cool. All right, and we've got a few people watching already over here. Some of our usual, some of our, our, uh, our regulars that like to tune in. We'll get started here in just a minute once we see people logging in. And yeah, see, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, Will. Yeah, there you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's one of the old barbecues where your dad was chilling, cooking tri tip. <laughs> there you go. Pretty cool. Yeah, man. Man, I was telling Will, my mom had like, your parents probably have it too. She has like the old photo album and we hadn't pulled it out in a while. And I was showing all the staff and a whole bunch of Daryl photos in there. So it was pretty cool to see that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. He loved a barbecue, that's for sure. I know, after a while. Oh, go, go ahead. What was his go to, uh, what was his go to barbecue meat? Oh, uh, it had to be tri tip, I guess. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Right there, sausage, man. And bread. Yeah. <laughs> Staples right there. Well, it's funny. You look, those were our old winemaker dinners, you know, back in the day. That's all we did, you know, pull out the yeah. pull up the trailer, throw the tri-tip on. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, you just see all the folding tables everywhere and, yeah. and you know, and the cheap linens and all that crap. It's pretty funny. Probably drink more beer than uh than wine. There's a little mixed bag, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was that was the good easy days. Well, it's funny seeing all these, seeing all these pictures because it was all around the landscape too, and it's just amazing now. If you look back 25 years ago, how the all these hillsides look different. And all it's just yeah, you see it. Uh, all right, you guys, let's get rolling on this. So we've got a few many people tuning in, joining us on both sides. Um, here on the Zoom and then over on the live Facebook as well. Uh, we've got some of our regulars again. It looks like Steve and Martha Hewitt are back again from cold and drizzly Columbus, Ohio. I'm so sorry you're going through that right now. It's about 80 degrees, <laughs> actually quite nice here. So it I'm outside out. right now and it's pretty dang nice, I gotta admit. <laughs> yeah. It is nice out. We're having some good weather right now here in Paso. So again, I'm Chris Toronto. I'm with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance, and you're tuning in for another Hangout. We're hanging out uh, this week with some awardees. Uh, we recently uh, give, gave out our awards for the San Luis Obispo County Wine Industry Awards. We have our winning wine maker of the year, our wine grower of the year, and our wine industry person of the year. Uh, we'll get into that again and, and uh, give them a, a, a quick second to talk a little bit about themselves and the like um, right now, actually, as they introduce themselves. And then we'll talk about the awards. Um, we'll talk about a few different things this time. I don't know if you tuned in for the awards themselves a couple Fridays ago, uh, but uh, we were all on our best behavior, <laughs> making sure that we stuck to script and all that kind of stuff. This time around, we get to hang out and, and talk a little bit and you really kind of dive deep into a little bit of their backgrounds and the like. So let's start with uh, Will. John, Will, tell us a little quick little bit about yourself and uh, who you're with and what you do. Yeah, so my name's Will. I, uh, I grew up in this area, actually a small town east of here in Sh uh, called Shandon. Pretty, uh, Amanda's familiar with Shandon. So is Joe a little bit, he coming to and from Bakersfield, passed by it. So I grew up on a big vineyard out there um, that was owned by Louis Lucas and then purchased by Mandavi and then sold to actually part of Amanda's family. They owned it for a brief little while. 
So after that, I went to Cal Poly, graduated, worked with my father for a handful of years. He had Daryl John Management Company, developed several vineyards around Paso Robles. And then uh, 2004, started my own business, bought a couple grape harvesters, started leasing ground, farming my own grapes, and here we are today. God, very cool. Yeah. Uh, Joe Barton, Joe, say hello and who you are and everything. Yeah, yeah, what's happening? Thanks for having me again. This is always a this is always a blast. You know, we've uh, did one of the first zooms. You know, early in when they were getting them going. So it's it's nice to be invited again. And obviously, with the awards and everything, with uh, my other two award winners, it's a pretty special deal. And um, I'm super proud of it and proud to be just, you know being next to Amanda and Will and being able to be at this hangout and all the other stuff we've been able to do with it. It's been great. Um, you know, uh, here been here for since 1994. Um, you know, got to know uh, Daryl and Will early on. They helped us out in the early days, and we've just seen the area grow. We've we've got our winery. We're making yeah six thousand cases of wine. And started a distillery about ten years ago as well. So, you know, I feel like we've been a pretty good fixture of the uh, past for winery landscape for a long time. And you know, proud to still be a part of it and enjoying it. My still run by my my mom and my wife and myself and. It's good. Life is good. Being in Paso Robles is great. So that's that's what I got. All right. On. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and then Amanda, say hello. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is so much fun. So much fun. So I'm fourth generation from the San Luis Obispo County region and grew up in Paso Robles, went to the local uh, colleges and graduated from Cal Poly. And I, I feel so blessed to be in the wine industry and surrounded by agriculture and really getting to tell the story of um, our region through wine to people all across the country. It's it's amazing that we've got people from, you know, Ohio tuning in. And uh, one of the beautiful things about COVID and the world we're living in right now is that we get the opportunity to connect in ways that we hadn't been able to before. And so um, I feel really blessed to be, you know, to receive this award for Wine Industry Person of the Year. Um, I can remember every year watching award winners you know, at the fair, which I have never, if you haven't been to the California Mid-State Fair, it is like, you have to come. It's so awesome. I have never, probably will. I don't know. Have you ever missed a fair, Will? Since I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, if you're I don't, why, I don't know why you would. I know, right? Yeah. So um, the fair is amazing. And I, you know, this is such, just such a big honor for you know, for people who live here. So I grew up and I'm so thankful to, be, to live in this community and work and I'm executive vice president at Ancient Peaks Winery. And uh, my first job in the industry was in college and uh, Will was actually um, operations manager, mechanic. Yeah, I, don't know. I, don't, I didn't really have a title. I think I was just, uh, yeah, I don't know what I was. but uh, Yeah, chief outlaw <laughs> or something like that. Um, yeah, that's right. That, so I remember getting a four-wheeler and a vineyard map of about a thousand acres and saying, go uh, count dead vines up and down these rows so we can order more plants. Uh, if yeah. there's Chardonnay planted in Cabernet blocks, like, <laughs> yeah. I'll take my fault. Cause, um, but that was actually back um, in our Margarita Vineyard, which I'm lucky enough to sell the fruit from today. So it, things come full circle and um, Joe and I served on the Pastoral Wine Country Alliance Board of Directors for a few years together, and um, I was lucky enough to, you haven't had uh, any of his hand sanitizer, it's right here. <laughs> right, I got my crowbar gear on, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so um, when COVID hit, they, they, uh, they, uh, went into like full go mode and made some awesome hand sanitizer and we ended up send, sending it to you know all of our accounts throughout the country so it's just crazy how connected this whole industry is and um, we're not competitors we're really friends and partners in the community so I'm just I'm happy to be here representing our family the next generation and and the beautiful region we live in. Right on thanks Amanda and yeah Amanda made makes a good point and, and this was honestly part of why I wanted to do bring them back again and do do this again is because 
they are all somehow interconnected, intertwined in so many ways, them and their families, because there's a lot of story that exists here behind like how Joe got some of his first fruit or how Amanda's uh, family vineyard, current family vineyard was planted and how the John family had something to do with both of that and then how they still continue to do business. I do want to start with you, Will, because um, you're our grower of the year, but Daryl, your, your, your father, who has passed, uh, was also named as Grower of the Year. I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about, if you would, maybe your dad, a little bit of his history and, and your guys' history in the region. Yeah, so my dad, uh, let's see, after Vietnam, he moved over to Shandon and planted the vineyard there. I think it was 1970 or 1971, so that was... Uh, Quite the quite the time ago. If you think back, then there wasn't there wasn't many vineyards or wineries around. So that's kind of I don't know. It's pretty interesting that you know how much has changed since 1970. That wasn't that did, long. Did ago. he have Did he have that foresight that said like this is the place to be to start to expand and create vineyards back in the 70s? Uh, you know, I, I I guess probably Louis Lucas did. He's the one that planted it. My dad just planted it for him. So Louis, you know he. He planted vineyards in Santa Maria as well, the old Tempest K vineyard. And um, shoot, I, I, it's there now. It's still there. I'm, I'm just not sure what it's called anymore. Um, maybe Joe or Amanda know what it is. I can't remember, but my dad grew up just um, just a stone throw away from, from that. Yeah. And it's yeah. a lot of uh, alfalfa and, um, and different, you know, kind of row crops growing out in that area. So taking a gamble on grapes was probably a pretty big deal. Yeah, no, I'm sure it was. And, and you know, back then they, there was no drip irrigation there. You know, I'm sure there was rootstock, but it was kind of a uh, pioneering new things. And I, you know, I remember some years where when I was growing up, you know, they were selling grapes for 75 bucks a ton and they were making money which is amazing to, you know, to think back and say, so, you know, now some of it's four or $5,000 a ton. And I don't know, it's just interesting. Yeah, so. it's actually, uh, and so your dad um, got a name for himself locally and Joe, I think he was, he was buddies with your dad. Is that right? You know, funny is that whole um, relationship was my brother-in-law actually um, was doing a water uh, project from the valley over to here, vice versa. And he had his um, kind of work trailer that they kind of use as their job, as their quasi job site. And it was right yeah, next right. door. It was right next door to Will's house. So um, then, so my brother in law got to know Daryl and probably had coffee many mornings, you know, just chewing the fat. And then, so then introductions to my dad and then. Yeah, I don't know where all of a sudden, you know, Daryl was a fixture in, at our property. He he was awesome for me. I was still at Cal Poly, so he eh, made some phone calls and helped me out and got me a job with Kendall Jackson when I was still looking to intern. And so that was super cool. And that was one of my first jobs running around. It's, it's funny, you know, you were mentioning some of those names like Louis Lucas and stuff. When I was with Kendall Jackson, I ran up and down here sampling like probably Amanda did at, <laughs> at her parents' place or at, at Ancient Peaks, you know doing all the vineyard work. So I was going up and down the central coast and all those names, you know, the Louie Lucas and Dale Hamptons down there. And then all the guys up here, yeah. you know, Daryl and gosh, I'm trying to think like Bob Goodwin back in the day, he was another vineyard guy. There's just like these, this is mad. I mean, when you start thinking back and looking back, there's so many like names of, of a generation of, of, you know, of industry people that were Manda's parents included that, you know, and their business partners started this area, and we're just kind of the ones that are getting to reap a lot of the benefits of that. I, I would, I would have to say. I mean, you know, I mean, they were, they yeah, have we are foresight, man. I mean, I mean, to think of, I mean, to think, I mean, the Ancient Peaks property. I mean, I mean, the, you know, that whole ranch, what that's become. I mean, that you wouldn't have probably even imagined what the kind of vineyard it is now, and then to do the the adventure park and everything. I mean, it's just. So many things have happened that have just been so incredible compared to what it used to be. And like I said, I was looking at this old photo album and looking at the landscape 25 years ago when we bought this property and just to see the growth in Paso Robles is pretty cool. And the fact that our families are all 
involved and still here and intertwined. That's probably the coolest part of it, I think, you know, and cool if I guess, you know, I know I feel this way. I'm, I, I'm sure Amanda and Will growing up here is, as kids, just to see what this place has become. I always, I always ask all the people who lived here, like growing up, what it was like before, because I grew up in Bakersfield, California. And when I go back there now, it's like a foreign place. I'm like, I don't even know it because it was a small, it wasn't a small farming town, but it was still a small town-ish. Now it's a metropolis. I mean, it's a metropolitan area. And so I have to think of, you know, I like, I talk to like Matt Ducey sometimes and when I'm on his house, I'm like, so what was it like before Target was here? <laughs> you know, he's all, oh, yeah, we used to just drive. We used to walk over here and we'd peer over and we could actually see the movie theater because that was theater drive and we could see the drive in, but we couldn't hear it. And so it's just, those are really cool stories. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, I, I yeah, think, it's cool. and, it, it's, and it's not that long ago either. It's not like it's a hundred years ago. That was like 25 years ago. So it's, it's pretty fun. You were talking a little bit about the special vineyard that Santa Margarita Ranch is. And so we'll, uh, and, then, and then Amanda, I mean, the two of you together, uh, a little bit about the founding of that vineyard. Uh, I understand, Will, your, your dad uh, basically planted that vineyard for the Mondavis, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I think 2000, 2001, somewhere around there, they, uh, they entered into a, a lease agreement with the owners of the ranch. Amanda probably knows more about that part of it than I would. And they planted it in three separate phases. And I think by 2003 or four, the planting that Mondavi had wanted done was, was completed. And it was, I don't know, like 820, 800, somewhere around 800 acres. So it was a pretty decent sized planting in a, in a very unique location. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, where our vineyard sits is almost 20 miles south of Pass Robles, and we're essentially at the foot of the Cuesta grade. Um, in fact, we did some work with the TB, TTB to extend the AVA to, um, to include one of the phases or one of the areas that wasn't originally planted in the Pass Robles AVA. So it, um, it's definitely a... That, a microclimate. I think that what's so neat about the region of Paso Robles is it's a, quite a large AVA. And so the sub AVAs really tell the story of all the different locations. I mean, uh, talking about the, the vineyard and the ranch that Will grew up on over in Shandon, um, it's a much different, it's a much different environment, soil profiles, weather patterns. Um, then we've got you know, in, in some of the other areas. And for down here, it's a it's a cold climate. That vineyard that they planted initially, I mean, as much research as the Mandavis did and as talented as Daryl and Will were, I mean, it's to go plant a vineyard in an area that has no commercial vineyards nearby is is interesting. And so what we found is it's really, it's, it's a cool environment. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I remember some of that, you know, I don't know what the blocks were, are, are now, but by that big pond that was constructed, that, that canyon that comes through there, I remember every afternoon on one end of the ranch, it might be a hundred in the summertime, but you'd go into that, close to that pond up that narrow valley, it like got a fog that would almost roll through there and it'd be 20 degrees cooler than the other end of the range. It's crazy. And to have those pockets that are different and that's what we call Trout Creek. And that was planted yeah. originally, I think it was either Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, yeah, and I it went in above like 22 degrees bricks. And so we ripped it out and then we planted Pinot. You know, so it was, it's just, that's what's so great about Paso is like the legacy of our region isn't really set. And so, you know, we're developing new sites or, you know, replanting some areas. Yeah, up fixing, fixing the sites that are putting the right variety where it needs to be. That's yeah, <laughs> it's just crazy. Like, this region is so in its infancy, and I don't mean that in a like negative way. It's just that, you know, in 1970, you're talking about you being in the vineyard in the grape business, right? And that's not that long ago. <laughs> that's not that long ago. So we don't have, you know, most of us don't have that many vintages worth of experience. Um, not like in France and and other regions. So it's. It's what makes it so exciting is that we are truly like setting that groundwork um, and really changing the community. I'm so proud that the way that we've grown is rooted in agriculture. 
the respect for the land and the, and, you know, it's not a, you know, urban and suburban community. It's really rooted in agriculture. So I'm, pr I'm proud of that. And I remember, um, you know, when we met a couple of weeks ago for that photo shoot, uh, Will and I started talking and, um, and he was telling me about this new vineyard that he had planted well, a few years back. Um, and I can remember gathering cattle with my grandpa on that place and mm. pushing and pushing the cattle down the road from one ranch to another. And today, you know, now he's got an amazing vineyard planted. And um, so it's just, it's just kind of crazy the way the world works. So. A lot of a lot of full circle stuff here. I think uh, something that you said that resonated uh, with me just now was uh, laying the groundwork. And I think that's what Daryl and Will and his part um, have done uh, a lot of because our, our region is still really young. And so, I mean, cheers to you and, and your dad uh, yeah, for sure. winning on the, the uh, Wine Grow Award because obviously with what we're talking about here, it's well-deserved. Mm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Joe Barton and winning the Winemaker of the Year Award. Joe, um, you're, you have some really fun, different wines these days, too. I mean, it started off with the Grey Wolf brand. Uh, then you've got Grey. Then you've got the Barton family stuff. It seems like people can't stop talking about a lot of the white wines that you're making. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the brand and, and how things came to be where they are today? Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I don't know. I, I, I got kind of caught just thinking about uh, different things, but, uh, you know, on the wine side, it's trying to stay young and, you know, and, and kind of piggyback on what Amanda was saying is like, you know, I think we've all gone to these like large wine tastings and whatnot and, and really had, you know, I've especially had some experience with some, you know, older European wines and, and there's this old vine thing. And, and it's, you know, I think it's always that, you know, that understanding that, you know, yeah, we are super young and we're still discovering what does really well around here. And I know Will's obviously planted things over the years and he's learned a lot about, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what was saleable back in the day. And then what now is what, you know, you're, you're trying to make for the, the best quality wines. And, that's been the biggest transition, I think, for all of us is that at first it was about, okay, what, you know, what was the definition of Paso at the time? But I think now it's more and more about us defining ourselves for what we believe it should be and what we found and what we've discovered. And that's been a lot for me of like going, yeah, I was looking through all this old, that old, that old album. And I was looking, you know, my, my winemaker, Brad is like, is that a Chardonnay? I was like, yeah, I did a Chardonnay back in the day. He's like, I didn't know you even did Chardonnay. I'm like, we did a lot of things. We did we did a lot of things that were trialing and, and then we still do great, you know, things like that. But I think what, what I've discovered when you're talking about white wines, it's like, I'm doing like Claret and Peak Pool and um, uh, Grenache Blanc and some of these Rome varieties that are super interesting that, I mean, we weren't even talking about 25 years ago or 20 years ago. And I think that's just been the, the, the explosion of, of the, the wine scene in general internationally. And it's bringing it back to here of us kind of, discovering some new opportunities here that we didn't know about before and now that we're seeing them evolve it's 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 just opening up a you know a, a playground that a lot of wine guys are super excited about um growers too because you know they're seeing things that that maybe they have opportunities to get into that maybe they never saw before and i'm sure with amanda you know you can market that all day long i mean we've just got such vibrancy here and such youth and such opportunity it's like we're not pigeonholed in anything and I think that's the fun thing. And, not, and I try to stay, I try to stay aware of that. I don't want to get caught in a rut. You know what I mean? I don't want to get caught just doing the same thing over and over again and thinking that there's not something new and exciting out there. And, and I just feel like if you're going to be in a place like Paso, you got to chase that. And, um, and it's a, and that's what makes it fun for me and keeps me wanting to evolve and keep, you know, branding too. like just, always just trying to find new adventures and, and, and it's worked. Maybe yeah, we'll find, like uh, maybe we'll find a, we'll, we'll bring back an old one. Maybe we'll bring back some Chenin Blanc. Hey, I made Chenin. I've done that one too. <laughs> That's what I'm, yeah. I, I keep kicking around planting a little Chenin Blanc out there in Adelaide. You know, there's some old vine Chenin out off of, uh, gosh, the old, um, oh my God, I try to, I'm 
loot. Bailey, the old Bailey, he's got some old Shannon out there. That's all seashell and oyster shell flavored. It's fantastic. So yeah, absolutely. There's some good Shannon blocks around. Yeah, and I know, and I've just just listening to you guys over the years at 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 the Ancient Peaks. I know you guys have played around with all kinds of stuff out there to just to, to try new things. So it's it's we're just we're just kind of scratching the surface here. We're just we're just getting started. Yeah, super fun. I think I, here, I'm going to put you on the spot, but I can do this because you're my friend. Why do you think you got <laughs> got this award? What, oh, do you, me? what makes you what makes you think like, hey, I was recognized? You know, I just think, and I think everybody, and I and, and I believe it. It's the three of us. I would. I'm not going to speak for the three of you know for for man and will, but I just think it's just. I think when you commit yourself to an area, and I think when you commit yourself to not making it about yourself, but making it about the region. That was very much the thing when we all first started. And I remember that, you know, I'm looking at an old, I'm looking at an old here, I'll show you. There's an old, it's an old Zinfest photo right here. My dad's in it. And um, that's from the old Zimadale. They would gather every year and they would make collaborative blend. I was part of it one time. And it was always the biggest thing that was the mantra of the association before and 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 I don't think it's been forgotten I just think it it was so much more of a clear path back then was it's about Paso it's about rising you know it's about all of us you know as a collective region you know you know meeting the challenge of trying to to compete internationally and I just I hope that just from a recognition from my standpoint was that I uh I helped steward that and I helped be a part of that and that, that's it. I mean, I think there's fantastic winemakers, you know, if we're putting, you know, wines side by side and who's the best, I mean, that's, there's so many good wines here. That's, that's not even a task worth trying to do. <laughs> I mean, it's just really more about how you represent this area. And just, I, I hope I do it well. I believe I do. And I, and I know Amanda and Will do it fantastically as well. So, I mean, I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better than myself, actually. Uh, nice work, Joe. You're always so articulate when you're on the spot. <laughs> a little bit of Chardonnay works. <laughs> <laughs> actually, what are you drinking? Let's find out what we're all drinking. Joe. I can't tell you what I'm drinking because it's not Paso at this moment. <laughs> that's okay. I think that's all right. What are you drinking? I'm actually drinking Barton, but it's uh, it's uh, from San Lucia Highlands. It's, it's Chardonnay, actually from a very um, old uh, farming family in the Salinas Valley, the Bokanugans. Uh, so the Bokinugans got a small piece of, of ground up on the, the San Lucia bench um, and uh, have just makes fantastic Chardonnay and Pinot. And they're also cattle growers in the Carmel Valley. And they're also um, uh, vegetable growers down on the down on the valley floor. So kind of fits the fits what we're all talking about is, is you know, historic families in our areas, you know, doing doing things well. Right on. Right on. Uh, Will, what are you drinking? So I'm drinking a glass of Herman's Story. My buddy Russell, I was down there a couple days ago or last weekend, and uh, he's got a new bottle of wine that it's not cheap, but boy, is it phenomenal. It's from his Shell Vineyard. I'm pretty sure he calls it Shell Vineyard. And boy, that thing is, is beautiful. It's a nice bottle of Cabernet, I'll tell you that for sure. Do you have the label to show? Uh, just... I don't have the label. It's in the, it's in the other. In the other uh, that's but... all right. It, it, it has a saw blade on it. It's a it's a beautiful label, it's, and the and the wine is great. Russell does a awesome. great job. Yeah, no, those are excellent wines uh, from yeah. Russell. So very very true. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, we're gonna get to you here in a second, but uh, what? Oh, you're drinking a topless. <laughs> yeah. So this is such a fun. Um, this is such a fun wine. It's the 2017 uh, Patron de Tablas. It's Syrah, Grenache, Movedra, and Cumois. And I love this project because it's a blend of different vineyards in different areas of the AVA that have all sourced um, plant material from uh, the nursery that Tablas Creek founded. So it's just, it's an amazing, amazingly affordable and delicious wine. So yeah, cheers. Awesome, cheers. Uh, for everyone at home, I'm having uh, an Ancient Peaks Renegade, so. Excellent. This is a, a blend of uh, Syrah, Malbec, Petit Verdot, Zinfandel, and Petit Syrah, and it is really delicious. So thank you, Amanda. Somehow there's a case of this stuff sitting in my office. Um, well thank played, Amanda. Well played. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that happened. Maybe that's how I won the award. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 
That's a really good bottle of wine too. It is. <laughs> I'll tell you how you won this award. Uh, you have been so influential in creating some really interesting programming uh, in the Paso region that still helps to lift Paso, but also to lift uh, people, whether they be, uh, you know, finding themselves just entering into this business, maybe they've been in it a little while and they need some further education, whatever it is. But on top of all of the great work that you do at Ancient Peaks, you've also really taken a lot of time out of your own time. And I don't know how you do it, to be perfectly honest. You have kids at home and all kinds of just everything pulling you in all different directions. And Ancient Peaks is such a large uh, business as well. But you created Wine Speak. You created uh, Dream Big Darling. They're both doing really well. I'd love for you to talk about those two things and how you juggle being you. Well, that's really, you know, the, the way it works is there's an amazing team that um, surrounds me and really helps make it all happen. So it wouldn't be possible without so many people that I work with and, and my family who you might never see, but they're really the backbone of, um, of organization, of execution, of, of pulling it all together. So I'm so thankful for them and I'm thankful for my family and our partners who are always deeply vested in the community and know that in order to move forward, we have to give back. And um, I've been with Ancient Peaks since we started in 2005, 2006, and that's, God, 15 years, just crazy, right? Even the, the industry has changed quite a bit um, in 15 years. And one of our goals is, Will was mentioning, you know, our vineyard is sizable. And so the, the farming game is difficult and it's, you know, you're, you're best suited if you can create um, um, a brand that helps showcase your fruit, your AVA, rather than just simply selling the fruit. And so when we purchased this lease back from the Mandavis, which was on our own ranch for Ancient Peaks and um, in 2005, that's what we decided to do. And so in order to accomplish our goal, it was important to, to establish a national distribution footprint. And so you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to um, hit the ground running and travel all around the country. And one of the things that I realized was this region is, um, you know, we're, we're new. And um, in order to spread the word about all the incredible things that we're doing in past roles, you know, we needed, we needed to get some education about the region out. And I know that Chris and Joel and the team at the Wine Alliance does an amazing job, but it was really important to, you know, bring in experts from outside of our area. Um, and so that's, I was lucky enough to make some wonderful friends that I feel so blessed to have in my life. And one of those is my, um, my dear friend, Chuck Bria, who's a master sommelier out of Hawaii. And uh, we dreamt up this event uh, called Wine Speak, and it was all about bringing uh, really people to the region, but also bringing people who had amazing things to share that were, you know, industry luminaries, bringing them all together for a small and intimate event. And so we created this multi-day project and it was, it has been really terrific, not only um, bringing people to the region, but also having uh, extending education and kind of a a, a different thought process uh, to our community that really wasn't there because we're such a rural environment and like LA and San Francisco, you have access to, you know, tastings and education and events all the time. But since it's getting better here, but we're, it's, we're in a rural environment, we mostly drink our own wines, most of the people who live, live and work here. So, um, but there's a big world out there and being able to travel has really been terrific. And then um, you know, establishing a nonprofit as a, you know, as a young, about five years ago when I had my daughter, who she's now four, well, I guess four years ago, she's almost five. Um, I remember thinking like, geez, how do we, how do we help the next generation? Like, how do we, how do we help the best and brightest uh, move to the top? And because the wine industry is, um, you know, it's, um, it's rooted in agriculture. And so sometimes the people who are making decisions are, you know, also the farmers and, and maybe they're not traveling the world and looking at what's happening with the next generation. And so it's important that we kind of, in order to be sustainable, 
as an industry, we have to, you know, get some different thoughts uh, at the, as seats at the table, so to speak. And so um, starting this nonprofit called Dream Big Darling was pretty incredible because it really, um, on a bigger scale, like I think more people need to dream big. I know the you all on 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 this segment, you know, you have your own companies and are doing amazing things, but the culture um, for so many is that like, don't take chances, you know, stay in your own lane, um, you know, and it's really a safe zone. And I think that there's so much beauty by taking chances, like the beauty of people planting vineyards in our area and trying new things. It's, um, you know, it's the, you have to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. And so starting this nonprofit was just been, it's been incredible because um, we're just seeing people blossom and there's a, a huge need for helping others succeed in a business environment and a, a networking environment. So it's been, it's been pretty amazing to help mentor uh, this next, this next generation of leaders in our industry. Yeah, and I know that uh, it's definitely gained in a lot, a lot of popularity. Uh, I think you have a, an auction even coming up here in about a week or so. Uh, how did it get its name, though? Dream Big Don. Okay, so, um, so, dreaming big. It's a, I'm if if you know the people that I work with and our families, um, these guys, you know, they dream big. I mean, who would have thought in 2005 you'd buy a thousand acre vineyard in an undiscovered area of pastorables and um you know it's they dream that's a big goal <laughs> that's a that's a big goal or um decide that you know zip lining is like the next big thing and we need six of them so they just they see the world in in this way that their the glass is always half full and it's always, what can I do instead of thinking of the negative first? And, and so I just, I love that, that they feel that ne nearly anything is possible and they work really hard. And when they don't do well, it's just failure is feedback. It's not really failure. So I think that that perspective is unique and not one that most people have ac regularly have access to. So that's where the dream big part comes in. And then Darling, my grandmother, um, I don't know if you knew her, Will, but uh, her name was Betty Carminetti. And yeah, if, Betty. if you ever had burgers at the Mid-State <laughs> Fair, she <laughs> had the best burger in the whole fair. And, um, Betty and Waldo, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I knew Betty and Waldo. Uh, so my, she was such an amazing part of my life, and I was so privileged to have an amazing grandma. But I mean, she was she was a telephone operator at the at Camp Roberts. I mean, not a famous yeah. person, not a, um, you know, not wealthy, just she had so much like love in her heart and I get all sappy about it, but, and kindness, like everyone she meet, she never met a stranger. And so she called me darling, but then, I mean, I think she called everybody darling and it was just this term of endearment. And so at her funeral, I remember she was like 83, I think, when she passed away. And we had to rent out the big room at the fairgrounds. Again, the fairgrounds, you know, like the fair is such a big part of our community. There was like 600 people there. And this, yeah, you know, she, awesome. was, she was not a young person that passed away. And so I just remember realizing that the greatest gift in life is kindness and how you make others feel and you you know they never forget that and so when I had my daughter I remember thinking like what's my legacy going to be like how am I going to make this world a better place for the next generation and so we jumped up this concept of helping um it really helping these young women who are sometimes going through motherhood and oftentimes like they're really fantastic but they end up choosing a different path because you know, they feel like they can't do everything. And so just trying to create a network um, for them was really important. And hey, I've got my, my dad is one of my biggest, I love him. I've, there's so many men in my life that have helped me. And it's not about being men, you know, we all have to work together, but we want, you know, if you're a capitalist or, you know, you want everybody rising to the top, that's how we're going to get the best results. So, so that's kind of, um, that's the story about the name, long-winded. <laughs> but still good. 
as we've as, as uh, myself and uh, Joe and even Will has said is, is uh, Amanda really makes uh, this much better because she's so polished and professional. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I on? You're on. Well, you know, and I was since we're talking about, it, I remember um, I was going to say it's like when I got on the board with Amanda, um, it was, you know, a lot of fairly you know strong opinionated individuals. And I was literally, you know, and I, and I put this in the right context. It's like, man, it was intimidating me a little bit because she was such a presence and she was so, had so much um, uh, vision, but strength, you know I mean? She was, she came in the room with a purpose and I was always like super impressed by that and, and not have knowing, not have really have known you before then, uh, just to see how you were in that room and, and, and just see what you've done with all of that and what you do with your, your association, yeah, I, it didn't surprise me, but yeah, you were uh, you were big you were you're big in that room. I, just, I gotta I gotta tell you that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> you I always I always know know that when when Amanda was <laughs> on the board and even thereafter, and she'd call me, oh, I got this idea, I, and I'd be thinking to myself, oh crap, am I gonna be put to work? <laughs> <laughs> am I prepared? <laughs> <laughs> like it's probably gonna be a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> He's not messing around either. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, I think we can see and cheers to you, Amanda, why yeah. the uh, industry person of the year. So, and with having two daughters, uh, you're 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 you set a great example of 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 giving 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 women hope and giving gr my girls hope too. And I know friends of ours are involved in the stuff that you guys do as well. So it's, it's awesome for my girls to have an example to to look up to. Well, and thank you, Joe and Jenny, for donating that item to our auction that's coming up next week. Um, it's going to be a virtual auction, super fun. But I got to, I got to pay it forward to Will because when we, he has two daughters as well. Yep. And um, when we were all meeting as a group a couple of weeks ago, he said, "What's that? What's the deal with that nonprofit you're doing?" And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he's like, "Well, do you want some fruit?" And I said. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? And and he's well, I've got this really nice vineyard that, um, you know, it's all you know, dry farm cabernet. And if there was any girls in your organization that maybe wouldn't have access to producing wine, um, I'd like to give them an opportunity. And so he's a but you have to come get it on Friday. And I think this was like a Wednesday or something. <laughs> yeah, it was a Wednesday. <laughs> It was. <laughs> yeah. If you don't come by Friday, it'll all be gone. So. <laughs> yeah, but it was so like that's just a, so I loaded up my horse trailer and we went and I took one of the there's a, a woman locally who is involved in the organization who is spearheading the the winemaking process. But we got a ton of Cabernet Sauvignon from a few different blocks on his Adelaide uh his Adelaide vineyard and it's I mean it's beautiful. It's a few different soil profiles and we're so grateful and you yeah, know it'd be, it'd be a good mix i'm glad you guys got it and i think they're gonna press it on saturday so Perfect. Cool. so yeah we're we're excited and thank you so much i mean this yeah is no my pleasure the community now is that is that going to go into a dream big darling labeled wine for the auction or something or yeah that? We're, um, there's three women that are working on the project and part of the process, which is really awesome is we're um, following the story of winemaking. And so we are, um, we're, we're sharing it all on Instagram from, you know, taking acid, tannin, pH and doing different things that are all related to winemaking through and, and taking, you know, our, our community through the, the process of developing a label and packaging. And we're actually going to be working with G3 um, and Abby Lopez, who is, uh, is going to be working on getting off all, all the dry goods. And so, yeah, it'll, five cases will go to Will uh, and the three ladies and then whatever's left over we'll use for our auction and some different things. But it's just, I mean, it's an incredible experience that, um, had he not said you come on Friday, I mean this it was a it was a goal, but it you know it was pretty it's just pretty amazing. So you know yeah, that's really cool. Good job, good job, Will. It's amazing. Job. Yeah. That's, and this isn't the first time that the John family has like helped somebody with some fruit like this before. I want to toss it over to Joe and Anda Will for that matter to talk a little bit about Joe your your dealings in that. 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Will's dad, Daryl, helped me out so much when I was when I was in need, and my dad passed, and and you know, and that's just such a, a vein. I think all three of us know that that's a, a part of Paso that you know, and I know I know Will hit it so so on point um, in the video is that that's what we kind of got into this business thinking it was like, and and that that's what what I had happened to me you know, not just with Daryl, but, you know, so many other people that were willing to lend a hand. And, and I think I love being able to pay it forward. And I know just seeing what Amanda's doing with her association to, to pay those things forward. It's so cool that we can, we can still have a wine community and have an industry, but we can still make sure that that's, you know, front and, you know, front and center on our, our overall ideology is that, hey, we want to see ourselves succeed, but we also want to see our community succeed. And with the White Alliance, I mean, I, I, you know, have to give, you know, props to the Alliance and everything that you guys do and to intermix, you know, our responsibilities in there too. I know on the board, that was always something that was important that we made sure that we also, you know, you know, you know, use that as, as a reason to, to have the, you know, bringing the producers and the growers together and then, you know, be able to give back to our community. And I hope it just keeps going that way. And I'm, and I'm so thankful that you know somebody like daryl and then will i mean will sprayed my place for free for a long time <laughs> and I, literally i'm sitting here right next to my room because i when i when i turned this garage into my my bedroom it was the funniest thing i didn't even ask you know i just all of a sudden i'd be sleeping to be three in the morning i'd hear oh right over here right where my hand is i could hear it, will go and i'm like huh well, ran this morning, you know, and, and, and that was, thank you, Will. I mean, I don't know how many years you did that, but Will just showed up and I know that was a pay it forward from his dad, my dad, to me through Will. I mean, that's just all, but we, I, you can't talk about that kind of stuff enough and you, you, you forget to, re, you just got to try to remember that, you know, as we start being the people on the other side of that now who have, have, given, have gotten the opportunity. So now we have the chance to pay it forward continue to do that and you know hopefully our daughters and sons and whatnot will do the same thing that we're trying to do right now and it'll just keep on going yeah absolutely it's awesome to have the ability to pay it forward like donating the ton of fruit to dream big garden i think it's i think it's a great thing and hopefully they come back next year and want some more so i uh i think it's great that i have the ability to do that like joe and amanda it's it's nice that we we can do things like that you got to tell everybody the story about the name. Oh, the armory? Yeah, so out there at, at the vineyard, it's on the Ramage property. And it was 70-year-old walnut trees. And these walnut trees were huge. And I was thinking, God, what am I going to name this place? And uh, out there spread all through the property is all these vintage army hats that the previous owner, there it's a metal army hat, like a like a button hat that the previous owner had bought and they were military surplus. He bought them for the, the, the guys that knocked the walnuts. They would get hit in the head with the walnuts as they fell down because they were all knocked by hand. So there was, <laughs> when we were developing that property, I probably found 50 of those hats scattered everywhere that had been this thunder, rusted. So I was gonna name the property army hat but my wife shot that down, so I came up with Armory. So Armory it is. They're usually smart like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I think, I, I think I'll make a wine from there, and I'll, I'll, call, I'll call it Army Hat. There you go. There you <laughs> go. That'll pass. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That'll pacify me. Yeah. <laughs> there is over on the Facebook side of things, Amanda, there's a few questions about uh, the auction and where people can go for it. Can you give a shout out on the website and all that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the you can get everything you need at dreambigdarling.org. And there's a link in the event section to our, our auction. Uh, you can see all the items. We were lucky enough to be blessed with a Kawasaki um, ATV four-wheeler um, from our friends at Kawasaki. And we've got an amazing build your own build your own bar where we've got shakers and the fancy ice cube makers and some of uh, Joe and a number of other uh, micro spirit producers um, and we've got a hog hunt. Will oh there we go yeah um, that is available and 
You know, our friends at J. Laura have donated a, um, a set of three liter bottles and a personal um, a wine educated experience tasting through the wines and, you know, stays at hotels, but it's all on the Dream Big Darling uh, dot org website if you'd like more information i actually just sent myself a picture of will's vineyard i don't know if we can show it if i can share the screen but i want you guys to see this place it's like, i can let you share the screen hang on well let's maybe yep. let's you should be able right, to. i'm gonna work Are you on send it send a picture of all the weeds oh all right you don't want me to show it then okay i won't <laughs> it, it doesn't look like there's any weeds in this one <laughs> good photoshop so I want, I want to talk a little bit about, as, as Amanda's pulling that up, Will, you sell to, because I, we were just talking about, you know, maybe you'll call a wine that someday or whatever, but you basically sell a lot of fruit and then you also have clients, of course, that you, you, you do some work for, but to a lot of brands in town. And then the Ancient Peaks Vineyard, the Santa Margarita Ranch, also is a source vineyard. Um, I think it's just, it, this is such a Paso thing that we're able to talk about that uh, and to say, yeah, yeah, we, there's fruit that is being shared across the ABA, not just shared, I mean, purchased, obviously, um, but that that is a thing here and that it is not necessarily kept really quiet and, and proprietary. I'd love for you guys to, starting with you, Will, talk a little bit about that. I mean, how many brands do you sell to and working with everybody in the region and the like? Yeah, you know, we grow enough acres that we, we have to sell to a lot of different brands. Um, you know, not one, not one winery could purchase, well, I guess they probably purchase more fruit, but not one winery could really purchase all that we grow, whether, you know, we, we grow it in all ends of the spectrum from, from the east side stuff that is targeted more for maybe a $20 bottle of wine or the, the place in Adelaide that's targeted for more uh, $50 bottle of wine. So, you know, we grow for all, all, all spectrums and there's a market for, for everything, just d depending on which wineries searching out which fruit. Yeah. So this is, um, this is Will's uh, Armory Vineyard. I don't know if you can see it, but talk about yeah. that soil profile, Will. You said that's the winemaker's favorite, favorite spot, right? Here. Yeah, you know, I take winemakers to this spot right here and it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing spot with all that rock. Um, and those plants actually have done fine in, in there. That's, that's a third leaf vineyard right there. That's a, that's a, really, that's a really unique spot in the, in the vineyard. I, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be interesting what happens there in the next five or six years. Okay, I gotta show this picture. So this is Justin, Tariq, and Will on the day we picked up all the fruit. Um, she's one of the three who will be, um, you know, making the wine or is making the wine. So, and she's already paying it forward, working with Cal Poly um, to create a scholarship program for uh, minority groups who want to enter the viticulture program. And I think they have over $300,000 raised annually for, for scholarships for that program alone. It's pretty awesome. Is she doing is she doing that with Charles Woodson with the uh, Intercept brand? She said she met with him, but I don't, she didn't say what, um, what they were doing. And I was there like, you go. Oh, who? And What's she's that? Like, I, think he, I think he plays football. Yeah, he <laughs> plays saying. football. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry to interrupt. No, you're not, not, not at all. It's a conversation. We're hanging out, man. Uh, well, uh, back to that vineyard and, and taking winemakers there. Why do they like that spot? What turns them on at that point in time as a winemaker? And maybe Joe, you can talk about this a little bit too. But what excites them when they're seeing that soil profile and elevation and aspect uh, in that area? Uh, they just they see more rock than dirt, so they're all over it. Pretty simple. Pretty easy. yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's just a, it, it's got it's got a really good slope aspect to it, and. Uh, yeah, when you look at all the rock that's there and how well the plants have done, like they, they've got a foothold in there. For that block, I think it had one drink of water the first year it was planted and hasn't had any since. So to anybody I take there, they, they, all the winemakers I take to that property, I show them that particular spot and they're like, can we have this fruit? 
I'm like, I wish, I wish I could sell it to you, but there was a gentleman that spent a lot of time out there before that place was planted. I mean, he spent so much time out there about drove me nuts walking around and, you know, he was always there and he, he staked off the, the blocks that he wanted and he's purchasing that. It's actually uh, Blake Kuhn with Letitia oh. Playhouse. Yeah. So Blake, he does a nice job and he's super excited about the fruit from that block. Well, and I love the, I can't remember the number, uh, uh, the clone, that one clone that you planted that you were so excited about that you're going to make yeah. your clone line out of. Yeah, but the clone, cluster... there's a, a Cabernet clone, clone 31. That is, I guess it goes back to the Tocalone or some of that other really fancy stuff. The problem is there's no yield. So like I showed Amanda the clusters, they look like a quarter instead of a Cabernet cluster. They're tiny. It would, I mean, uh, the, the, the berry size and the cluster size, I, I it was like nothing I've ever seen. And I think, yeah. It, for it, those it, of you that don't farm grapes, what Will's talking about is this is the nutrition value in the soil. So when the vines have to struggle, they typically produce a higher quality product or fruit. So it's a smaller berry with a higher uh, skin to juice ratio. So the smaller the berry, the more typ typically the more concentrated the flavors are. And then soil profiles like the one that he's talking about, it's, you know, if you go to the most famous regions in the world, it's, it's profiles like that, especially, um, is it, is it limestone? I'm thinking like, um, you know, in Bordeaux and I, I'm, it's very similar. Yeah, the, 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 it's loaded with limestone there. Yeah, like really super Mille high Mille. pH. Yeah, really high pH. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And the slope, you were talking about the slope and I know this is similar to Joe's, a lot of the vineyards Joe has, but I mean, the average slope you said it was like 15 to 20%. I mean, these are, you know, it's, it's not, it's not flat ground. It's um, meticulous farming, meticulously farmed areas. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think from the winemaker's perspective, you chasing stuff like that. I mean, we, we can't help but fall in love with stone, you know, I mean, that, and, and you know, you see concentration, you know, you see small berries, exactly what Amanda was talking about. You know, you get these small clusters, these small berries, you're thinking about this concentrated fruit and this, this concentrated tannin and, and texture and richness. And, you know, so much of just the signature of, of ground comes from those, those kind of areas. If you go around the world, you, you'll look at these, these kind of statements of terroir and, you know, what they do is they, they, they lend a signature to the wine that, that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, it, it enables you to, to be very, um, oh, you own that. You get to own that idea. You get to own that texture because that's not something you can have around the world. I mean, you can't just re replicate that, you know, a couple hills over, or, you know, or a couple, you know, a couple counties over. That's why one pass Robles is so unique. I mean, and obviously, you know, not just with what Will has. I mean, um, his neighbors have, you know, all, you know, you know, owned up that, you know, to that beautiful terroir of the Halter Ranch and the Tablas Creeks of the world that are right there, right next door. And they have that, those same kind of profiles, but just to see, um, you know, you know, to see that ancient seabed, you know, I, I think what, you, Chris, you've done, spoken about this many times. It's like the terroir in Paso Robles is so unique and so different than anywhere else in the world that, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, I'm where I'm sitting right now was deep ground. I find shark teeth and whale bones around here, you know, and what, you know, um, you know, I would imagine that that's the same kind of stuff that Will would find, you know, in his, in his place at Armory. And then when you go up to uh, Amanda's, you start getting to the oyster beds and the sea shells and, and that whole, you know, you know, you know, kind of terroir. And, and that's what we get to kind of play around with. And as the vines get deeper and older, they express it more. And that's yeah, why I also, absolutely. And that's when I talk. That's when I talk about with people of like. That's why the infancy of this of this region is 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 that because we're talking ten year old, fifteen year old vines. You know, maybe that, that makes up a lot of the new plantings in these areas. There's Amanda showing it off right there. You know, <laughs> once these vines really truthfully tap into it when they're twenty five to forty years old, that's when you really see the texture of it. You really see the consistency of it they're young they're I mean I always say vines are like people you know when they're one to ten years old they're vibrant they're adolescent they're they're running they're trying to grow they're 
expressing themselves through usefulness, you know, and then they kind of go through that 10 to 20 year range where they're starting to grow into themselves. They're starting to show you what they're going to be and they're starting to have consistency and they're starting to have signatures of what you can expect out of them. And then when you get to those 20 years and on, then you really get to, to taste the flavor of what they are and what they're always yeah. going to be. And then you see the maturity in them and you can see it in the chemistry and you can see it year in and year out where no matter what a winemaker wants to do, he wants to overlay it with oak or he wants to do different fermentation techniques or, you know, or, or different aging techniques, the signature of that vineyard will always come through. And that has everything to do with those stones and it has everything to do with the terroir and the, 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 the exposition and all that good stuff. So and Amanda's got a rock there. I was gonna show real quick though, cause there was a note about Chateauneuf du Pape. And so this is a, a galet from Chateauneuf. Uh, and then this is some of the stuff we have here. Um, as you can see, this stuff is a lot more worn and, and, and rounded than this. But believe it or not, if you look at these two, this stone here is much heavier than this one here that's much larger in its course because these are a little bit more porous. And so while we do have some limestone in Paso, and for all intents and purpose, um, that's what this stuff is. However, these things and, and real limestone has a lot more calcite and dolomite in it, and it's also been heat treated, if you will. It's had a lot more pressure put onto it. And that's why they're maybe a little weightier than say these things, because these can be porous. So these will actually take on water. Not to say that these don't as well, but just not as much as some of this stuff does, which it can get up to one and a half times its own weight. So Amanda, you were gonna say something. Oh yeah, well, so this is from a Laventure, um, the Willow Creek district. And, um, you know, I don't, is this limestone, I don't, you know, I'm thinking this is the what you're talking about, but then this is um, petrified oyster shells that come from our vineyard. So it's just, you know, yes, it's different than uh, Chateau Neuf, but like in Chateau Neuf, when you go to that region, you know, at first when you see the pictures, you're like, yeah, there's no way those stones cover everything. And then you go there and you're like, they cover everything you know and uh, it's just it's amazing that's what I love about the world of wine you know it's every region tells a story um there's something special wherever you go and it's just it's so neat that it tells a story of the people and the place and the geology and you know it's just it's pretty it's pretty amazing so. It is definitely a sense of place. We're wrapping up. I want to make sure that all of you have one more little opportunity. Like if you have something coming up or you just want to share one more thing, let's do that before we say cheers and call it a day. Will, I'll start with you. Uh, you're uh, yeah, I, I just want to say congratulations to Joe and Amanda. It was great winning it with you too. And cheers. It was awesome. Right on. Cheers. Cool. Hey, Joe. Hey, Chris. <laughs> we'll see you in a little while. Uh, <laughs> hey, what, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have anything coming up? you have any virtual tastings and stuff like that happening anytime soon? Uh, no, nothing, nothing crazy. I mean, same thing as Will. I mean, I think this has been such a pleasure for me to, to, to have a time to kind of recollect and, uh, you know, you know, you know besides, you know, the fact that Amanda and Will are, you know, such worthy award winners as well and being involved with them. I have so many friends and family and whatnot that send, send kind words, people in the industry to send kind words. That, that, that was, you know, I, I'm thankful. I just want to thank everybody who, who reached out and, and who gave kind words because uh, as we've all known, this has been a lot of work for all of us over a lot of years and I know we're all well deserving and I'm just, you know, um, just thankful that I have so many good people in my life and and uh, just so happy for Will and um, Will and Amanda as well. Right on. Thanks, Joe. Amanda, I know you have your uh, upcoming auction. Uh, anything else happening on the Ancient Peak side? And what would you like to share? Well, I, you know, first and foremost, I want to say thanks to all the people who have tuned in, who are watching these sessions regularly and buying and supporting wines from small family producers like ourselves, because without you, um, you know, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be in business. So cheers to you all for, um, for, you know, taking the leap of faith and, and giving past troubles a chance. And we hope that you come and see us when you get, when, when you get a chance to Joe's, Joe's modest, but he just re 
they redid their tasting area and it's really beautiful. There's a gorgeous courtyard. It's, there's so many things uh, in our region to come and see when you get a chance to. And um, for us, we've got, we've got all sorts of things happening. Later this evening, we're partnering with uh, some lead from Oahu, Hawaii to bring some voyage to life, which is all about um, you know, aloha and travel. And so we'll be talking about Merlot and Malbec, who are sisters um, in the wine world, which is a lot of fun. And that's free to join via Zoom. And then we've got the Dream Big Darling auction, which is later uh, next week, uh, the 6th through the 8th. That, again, just take a, take a look at our website, dreambigdarling.org. And it's an incredible organization. So if you feel like buying some uh, amazing wines um, or some fun, some fun goodies. Uh, it all goes to a great cause. So, and thanks to you, Chris and everyone, Jen, I saw her and, and Joel and the entire team at the Wine Country Alliance for um, keeping things going and doing these series. It was a lot of fun and congratulations to you guys as well. So. Cheers. Right on. Cheers, everyone. Cool. Mm. And everyone watching uh, at home or wherever you are, uh, tune in again next week. We'll have another Zoom hangout. I'm attempting to finally do this Ask the Sommelier thing. I've had um, a sommelier who is also a, um, a Master of Wine candidate um, and a wine critic, actually, uh, to come and be on Zoom with us where I can do a little bit of a kind of a master class on Paso and then open it up to everybody at home to say, you got a question for the sommelier and let her rip. Uh, maybe even get you on camera. I think it's finally happening uh, next Saturday, unless she cancels on, or I'm sorry, Saturday, next Thursday, unless she cancels on me um, for whatever reason, and then we'll either have a replacement show or maybe no show. I don't know. Uh, but do tune in to PasoWine.com to see what we've got coming up or watch our Facebook page as well, and we'll be uh, able to share it with you. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Joe, Will, Amanda. Congratulations again. Cheers. See you next time. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Bye.